Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix, and I'm here with Friederike Ernst today. Today, we're speaking with Frederick Haga, who is the co-founder of Dune Analytics. Dune is an analytics platform focused on blockchain data. Before we talk with Frederick about Dune Analytics, we'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. Omni is your new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet. Omni supports more than 25 protocols, so you can manage all of your assets in one place across all major EVMs, Layer 2s, ZK Sync, and Starknet coming soon, and non-EVMs. But what's really special about Omni is that you can do all the most important things in Web3 directly within the wallet itself. Want to get yield? Omni allows you to get the best APYs with zero fees in three tabs, be it staking, liquid staking, lending, or yield vaults. Need to exchange USDC on ETH to add them on Cosmos, Omni aggregates all major bridges and DEXs so you can bridge and swap across all supported networks in one transaction. Love NFTs, Omni offers the broadest NFT support of any wallet, so you can collect and manage your favorite NFTs across all chains in one place. Omni truly is the best and easiest way to use Web3 and most importantly, it's fully self-custodial, meaning you never have to trust anyone with your assets other than yourself. If you want to use, you can even use Omni's ledger integration so all your funds stay on your hardware wallet. Join tens of thousands of this next generation wallet by downloading it today on iOS or Android at omni.app. So, welcome, Frederick, to Epicenter. Thank you so much. Very excited to be here. Epicenter was one of my first main, main sources for understanding this crypto world when I got excited about it back in 2015. So, cool to be here. Yeah, awesome. I think we actually met at a Epicenter meetup in DEF CON 4 in Prague. So. Really awesome to, to have you on today. And obviously you come a long way. I, I think that's also where we wanted to start, right? Like basically how uh, did you come up with the idea for Dune? Kind of like can explain a little bit what is Dune? How did you get into crypto and, and to build Dune? For sure, yeah. So uh, me and my co-founder, we were working at a big company back in 2017 when, when the sort of hype happened uh, for the ICO craze and all that. And uh, we, uh, I was working full time on, on blockchain. I was already interested and, and managed to sort of work on it because of all the interest. Um, and then I met my co-founder. He was also interested. Um, and uh, we ended up forming a small team, doing a lot of prototypes and playing around with uh, blockchain and, and building on Ethereum first and foremost um, and built prototypes and did hackathons and all that. And then over time, we realized that sort of during the spring of 2018, that you know the hype is kind of dying and, and people are not that interested anymore, and this technology is still very young and clunky, and so like this big corporation might not be that interested anymore, which was fine and understandable, honestly. Um, so, but we were nevertheless just as excited about the technology and the potential for you know open finance and programmable assets on the internet and whatnot. So. Um, we started thinking about problems to be solved really um, in, in the space and we had, since we had built and deployed some smart contracts, we knew that getting the data was, was pretty clunky and hard. Um, and so, so that kind of what seeded the idea for starting Dune. And then over time, um, we also understood that the fact that this data is inherently open is like a total game changer for how you can build a data product uh, in, in this space. and. You know, it's it's a huge paradigm shift. Whereas previously, all data and all data tools is like in closed environments, like inside the in, you know engineering or product organization building a Web two product or inside of a financial institution. And the the name of the game is really closed and um, you know building tools around proprietary data sets and, and whatnot. Um, and so I think that the thing that we understood pretty early on was that, oh, when, when the data is open, like you can actually aggregate, you know, aggregate all of this knowledge and, and building that people do in the space as opposed to defaulting to, to private. Um, and we sort of flipped it on its head and said it's default public, right? Um, so, so that's kind of how we, we got started. And then in the beginning, it was like really hard, impossible to raise any funds. We didn't have a salary for many months. And um, yeah, we traveled to a few of these like eat hackathons and DevCon and whatnot on like a very tiny budget, sharing hotel bedrooms, what's and me, and, and just uh, tried to find anyone that would in, was interested. And it was hard because not that many products were actually live with the usable products um, 
at the time, right? So uh, the sort of market was small, but you know, there were a dedicated group of people that kept building and, and were excited. Um, and those were the ones we tried to serve. And, and I think that has turned out to be a good idea to bet on, on the people also betting on, on this future. So in a way, what you've done is kind of you've um, aggregated a an enormous database that people can easily query, right? And basically your, your products kind of fall into two divisions, so the dashboards and the API. Um, c can you kind of talk about the distinction between those and what exactly they offer? Sure. So, so in its simplest form, what we do is we take data from the blockchain nodes, we put it in a database, we do some transformations to make it easier to work with. So you have smart contract events, um, you have other abstractions on top of that as well. So you can see, oh, this is a Uniswap trade, but you can also say, oh, here's a table with all the trades from all the DEXs and you know easily query that. So uh, we put a lot of effort into good sort of data UX. Uh, and what we do then is to allow anyone to go to our website, uh, browse all these tables, write SQL queries on top of it, get results, and then um, visualize it and turn it into dashboards. And, and I guess what I alluded to earlier is the fact that this is all public by default. So if you go on Dune and you do something, someone else can see it, they can see the SQL, they can fork it, um, they can make their own version and, and whatnot. So it's all kind of remixable and uh, open for anyone to, to build on top of each other. Um, and then um, also we're about to launch an, an API product, which has been highly demanded for a long time. Um, and essentially, you know, take any of these endpoints that underpin these dashboards and, and query results and turn it into programmatic, uh, programmatically accessible API endpoints, which I think is going to be a massive enabler for a lot of people to, to not have to do all of this tedious um, data infrastructure and, and maintenance of pipelines and whatnot to, to query this data. Yeah, uh, we're going to get a bit into like what the use cases are. I, I think one question that maybe people are interested in is like if you talk about the dashboards, obviously we have uh, a lot on, on Dune. Do you have a, a favorite dashboard yourself and then which one is it? So I, I've had a favorite for a while and I, I think it's maybe even more fashionable right now, um, which is uh, MakerDAO's balance sheet uh, built on Dune. Um, and I think this was a, a particularly exciting example. I think they built it out a couple of years ago, really. Um, but the fact that you can have a real-time balance sheet feeding from the blockchain that anyone in the world can go and look at on a website and they can see what which query created this balance sheet. And you know, if you don't like it, you can fork it and you can massage it, right? right? So it's, it's really very scrutinizable. And the fact that it's real time and you can see which assets, which liabilities, all these things uh, and the revenue, right? Block for block, you can see the revenue coming in. Um, and so you can do like all the way from like financial auditing to even investing. And you can say, oh, I can have a real time price to earnings ratio for the maker token, right? You can look at that metric that analysts in the traditional equity world would figure out once Four times a year, whenever the PDF drops, you could say, oh, now it's priced this relative to the last quarter earnings, right? But like literally you can do that every 12 seconds on the Ethereum blockchain um, with, with a Dune dashboard. And I think this was very illuminating because it displayed, you know, people have been looking at all kinds of weird metrics on Dune, but this displayed, you know, the old world kind of, but in, in this new world of, of our so on, on blockchains. And I think that was a very illuminating example. And then, of course, with, with the FTX fallout recently and, and their cooking of books and, and whatnot, or lack of books altogether, maybe, illustrates how insane it is that MakerDAO and whatever other financial product built on, on the blockchain is there for people to audit, to monitor real time. And, and there's no hiding, you know, it's like completely illuminated. And Ethereum has been, you know, uh, called this like dark forest, but I think like, uh, Dune is a huge flashlight uh, into that dark forest, illuminating everything you want to see. Really, you can you can get there and you can look at it. And I think the beauty of Dune is that this is not you don't have to be deeply technical to to go there. You you 
can look at what other people are doing and you can tinker around and you don't need to set up data pipelines and infrastructure to understand, which I think is powerful. The dark pool allegory is usually used to to refer to the mempool though, right? It's not, I mean, so basically everything that happens on blockchain is by default um, open. I'm not going to say transparent because I, I totally hear you that basically getting the data is not always easy. It is possible though. Um, but maybe let's talk about the difficulties um, that you guys um, have uh, navigated, the challenges that you have uh, grown to um, with Dune. So basically, why why is actually getting this data together, why is it difficult? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. Um, so I think Well, so a blockchain is a system that's built for like verifying transactions and, and you know activity as it happens and letting people sort of write to the blockchain, right? But it's not necessarily optimized for getting data out of it in, in large quantities, um, right? So, so already building a blockchain is a hard engineering problem and the constraints that you would focus on is, is the verified how many can easily you know, verify it and then you can actually uh, make transactions and, and, and interact with it. Um, so the whole sort of, let's call it big data aspect of it is, is not really what that system is designed for. Um, and so that means that it's actually surprisingly complicated to get the data out. Um, and you, know, you need to go block for block and ask for all the different things that, that happens uh, in the chain, um, and, and since like a node this is a piece of stru- uh, software that's not optimized for this, this is way more messy than mo- most people think. <laughs> and and it's not like you just hit play and all the data just arrives. Like things happen. There's weird transactions that stall the uh, the system. And, and I think the most you know extreme example or or clear example of these things are these. Um, sort of get forks, so something like uh, Binance Smart Chain or Polygon that have tweaked the parameters of, of the get node with essentially lower block time and higher um, throughput, right? Um, and so what happens then is that some of these nodes have a really hard time sort of reproducing something that happened, uh, say, you know, a million blocks ago. And so it, it means that their, if their block time is three seconds, but they might spend so uh, spend like a minute producing a trace of something that happened. And that means when you're backfilling that chain, like you diverge from head. <laughs> if, if it takes one minute to get a block and, and it's produced, you know, 30 or 20 blocks <laughs> in that time, you've gotten one more block and then you've, you're 20 blocks behind, right? Uh, further behind than what you were before. Um, so since these are systems that are not really built for taking the data out, you do have the uh, issue of like all these kinds of bottlenecks and quirks. Um, and so it, it requires a lot of handholding to just get the data out. And then of course, just like having a performant infrastructure and system in place to efficiently query uh, what's becoming a lot of data and you know, there's Ethereum, but there's also these other EVM chains that typically have more throughput and produces more data. And then you have things like Solana, which kind of think in, in less than a week produce more data than the whole of Ethereum's history. Um, so, uh, you know, there are non-trivial amounts of data as well um, to query. Yeah, I totally get that. Maybe maybe let's dig down a little bit uh, deeper though. Um, just, I mean, maybe let's stay on Ethereum uh, exclusively, because I totally understand that basically other chains uh, with uh, d- you know different block gas limits and so on um, ha- have have higher amounts. Let's say I have an archival node running, um, and that basically gives me the state of um, each variable at each block, right? So um, why why would it be difficult for me to kind of run a query on that? archival node. I mean, I, I, I mean, running an archival node itself is a non-trivial thing, right? But I mean, if, if, if you're going to do that, um, what exactly 
is the bottleneck for me if I want to grab, like, say, um, the Uniswap volume for a specific token pair over the last two years? Yeah, so, you know, you, you, I think you need to know then exactly what you... Um, exactly what you want to look at, which is also not, not trivial, right? So you say, okay, I want to look at Uniswap volume for the last few years. Okay, that's, I don't know the exact number, but it's probably at least in the tens of thousands, maybe in the hundreds of thousands of contracts. So you first need to figure out like which contracts do I care about, um, which are definitely a lot because they deploy a new contract for every market that they create or every pair, right? Um, so, so you need to somehow know what data you're looking for from the node. Um, and then, of course, you, you get that, then that in and of itself won't give you the answer because you also, for instance, would need a USD price. Like if you wanted to aggregate all this volume, you need to know, okay, if like, you, did, you know, Catcoin and Dogecoin are traded, what are those actually worth? That That's, you know, some data you would get from the blockchain, but wouldn't be practically that useful to you need something else. So you need the USD volume. So you need to fetch that somewhere and 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 um, <laughs> join it and, and, and uh, you know, multiply the amounts. Um, so you have that type of problem. And then you have other sort of higher level sort of curation problems where there's a lot of spam, for instance. So some will create some sensi nonsensical token, you know, do one trade that makes it worth a billion. And then you can do a massive trade uh, that looks like it's like one billion dollars worth of volume, but it turns out it's like you know just some folks uh, trading with each other on some worthless token, right? So so there's also like that element to it. So uh, I think it's like both technically non-trivial. Uh, there's also a lot of context um, that you need to to do this. Yeah. So, so basically, it's the integration of different sorts of information into one database, together with kind of the categorization and curation of different uh, contracts and feeds. Is that is that high level correct? Yeah, I, I'd say so. Uh, you know, also, sort of the benefit of, of what we do is that we we we, we fetch absolutely all of the data, right? Um, and so you can sort of have that as a starting point. But if you interact with a node, um, you know, if, if you do want to answer some specific question, you do need to know what data you want to do, but then, and you can run that and it's going to take you a long, long time and you have to sort of handhold the process. And then if you say, oh, but actually I want to check this other thing or match it with this other thing, you know, then you have to do that whole exercise over again, where it's like, oh, but actually, you know, I want a question related to balancer pools, uh, you know, then, then you have like a whole process going. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it, it, I think it's essentially just in theory doable, but in practice, like a lot of hard work and a lot of uh, you know, mess, even for a sophisticated sort of data engineer. Right. And you recently also upgraded, I think maybe going a bit to the technical part of it, from like a V1 due into V2. Can you talk a little bit about what what you've changed there and, and how it improves the the Dune experience or also like what was the problems with the Dune experience so far? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we had a Postgres-based uh, system for, for Dune V1, which was a great start for Dune, um, a great piece of technology, but um, with a lot of data, it became a problem. So. Um, Basically, a lot of queries would time out um, and, and like a Postgres type of system is good at sort of being fast uh, on relatively small amounts of data, but not great when, when it comes to a lot of data. Um, and so there, there were a couple of limitations in, in addition to like performance over large data sets. Like you couldn't, you couldn't um, look at, say, like median gas price over the history of the Ethereum blockchain. We just time out. We run for like... 30 plus minutes and then, you know, you wouldn't get a result. Um, there, there's also, there was also the problem that like each chain we added was a different database and you couldn't work on, uh, across them. So you couldn't benchmark data on Polygon and Ethereum. Um, they had to be like separate queries. Um, and then furthermore, like all the data pipelines of creating these tables that we have, like DEX trades and NFT trades and these abstractions I talked about was, like very messy, 
because these were like scripts that pulled some data and sort of referencing each other, like uh, very, very complicated to, to maintain and understand which data relies on which data, um, on what tables and, 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 and whatnot. So essentially we, we've now launched um, sort of Dune Engine V2, which is based on uh, like a data lake and more like a modern cloud data warehouse uh, architecture where we have all the data uh, for all the different blockchains in, in like a data lake. And then we have a query engine on top of it. Um, currently Spark based, but we're also doing some exciting new things there. Um, and essentially allowing you to traverse all the different uh, sources. So you can, you know, benchmark Solana and Ethereum and Polygon and all these things in one simple query. Um, it allows us to have way better pipelines and checks and balances on how the tables are created. Um, also, we can now have communi community contributions on the data layer. So not only can people write queries, they can also create new tables uh, with something with a product we call Spellbook. Um, so people can then, you know, create all kinds of derived data sets that are easy to query. They can write their own tests and, and ensure that the data is of high quality. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a system that's way easier to maintain. We can have invite the community into uh, contributing more um, and sort of self-serving to more use cases. And then, yeah, there's some amazing performance benefits. Um, and sort of what, what the typical modern data stack looks like, we're kind of you know, creating that and enabling that for, for the community um, where you can do median gas price in, in you know, a couple of seconds or, or, or a few minutes at least. Yeah. You just alluded to the fact that you now also support Solana, which is a new development. So previously it was only EVM chains. And despite the fact that kind of the block gas limits and block times kind of vary between different EVM chains, um, I assume um, the basic infrastructure is fairly similar between all of these. Um, how, how, are, how are things different for Solana? And how did you make the decision to support Solana over a number of other non-EVM layer one projects that also have traction like Cosmos or Substrate or Avalanche or similar? Yeah, um, great question. So so first of all, like we, we want to support all blockchains and, and everything that, that's interesting. So it's not the goal in and of itself to, to limit it. Uh, I think what we have cared a lot about is the user experience of uh, you know, using the data on Dune. And I think that's frankly one of the things we got right were, you know, the, the, the easiest way to make some money being a data business in like 2018 or 2019 was to like just integrate with all the chains that have raised a ton of money. Um, we didn't do that. Like we stuck to Ethereum where essentially no one would pay us to do this, but um, we figured, you know, this is where people are building. So let's serve them. Um, and so for us, the important thing is that there's um, an ecosystem of, of developers, of applications, of users and, and communities that actually want to query this data and, you know, do interesting things with it. Um, and then sort of we, we do the work of, of the integrations. Um, and as you alluded to, it's been way easier for us with EVM chains because all the infrastructure, all the processes are the same. So when we add something like Polygon, like it, it is, um, there's definitely challenges with every system one learns, but, but you know, in broad strokes, uh, a lot of the architecture and processes are the same. Um, so with something like Solana, um, you know, th this was actually the first also blockchain we put on our new Dune V2 uh, engine. So we, we figured this was a nice stress test to the system because it, 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 they produce a lot of data. Uh, but we saw that there, there was a lot of people building on it. There were actual products being built, users using them. And, and then we decided to integrate it. Um, and we honestly also have built out this new platform, uh, which has been you know, also a learning experience and something we've had to, to work a lot on and therefore have been painfully slow, honestly, in integrating some of these new blockchains. But now the, the new platform is getting into a more stable uh, state and then, then we can go more aggressively on integrating new chains. So um, it's not 
something we deliberately sort of try to avoid, but we try to make sure that the UX when we do integrate is good and that there's an interested community to to work on top of it. And of course, like the technical complexity plays in if it's an entirely new system, then it is more work to to get it right. Cool. Yeah, we wanted to talk a little bit about kind of Dune's business model and also, I guess, the user base. You mentioned already like the community and everything. I think one one interesting thing about Dune is that it's it's basically one of the few products that has this kind of SaaS model, let's say, in the in the Web3 world. And uh, we were interested to hear a bit about, you know, like also how many users are there on Dune? How do you think about this pricing? How much people... Uh, revenues are there whatever you can you can tell us about kind of how this this all works um we'd be happy to learn yeah where, where do i start um i think we have built a very strong community on dune um i think we've actually and without the token <laughs> which i think actually has been been a good thing for us frankly um because there is like a kind of proof of work on, on getting into dune you do have to you know, make some sacrifice, uh, put in some work. Um, and that has made our community very sticky and healthy, I think, because people actually put in work to, to get there and learn. Um, I think we, you know, we empower a lot of people. So as I alluded to earlier, like it's not only developers that use Dune, but a lot of non-technical people learn SQL with them for Dune. Um, they do some tutorials, they fork some queries and they get started and suddenly they get paid uh, to work on Dune. They pick up bounties, they get a job. Like a lot of people have claimed like fantastic top jobs in protocols and venture firms and whatnot, starting from basically nothing and having no online presence and then working on Dune, building some nice important dashboards and and getting like top jobs, right? Um, so I think that that's a very important part of it that uh, I often think of so our community and, and sort of the Dune team building the product in, in terms of this um, Spider-Man meme where they're like, oh, so, you know, you built a great tool, you helped me do this. And we're like, no, you you did like a lot of cool queries and, and you helped us, uh, you know. Uh, so I think there's a lot of sort of mutual appreciation uh, between the people building Dune and, and our community, which I think is a, a fantastic thing. So in terms of like how big it is, um, we have like a few thousand people creating queries a month. Um, we don't have like a huge user base on the creator side, but since Dune is kind of like a marketplace all the way, almost where uh, you know people can uh, come in and, and see anything that's built, it's like a creator side and a consumer side. And so we believe that if we empower uh, you know, creators, uh, they can make amazing things and a lot of people can benefit from that. So we don't necessarily need a hundred thousand query creators. You know, if we have someone that's very engaged and create amazing things, we can have, we do have like millions of page views. Um, and then some of those convert to creators, um, learn the craft and, and, you know, get into it. So, so that's kind of the, the dynamic. Um, we have about 50,000 dashboards on Dune, um, underpinned by like 300,000 queries. Um, so it's, it's quite substantial. Yeah, so I, th I think the, the heart of the question goes to this. So currently you operate under this, you know, subscription uh, model, right? So basically there's different tiers. So basically you have to pay for kind of keeping your dashboards private and having the watermark removed and so on. Um, and then this kind of... Um, when you compare this with um, your recent raises, congratulations, by the way. So you raised repeatedly over the last couple of years. So at first it was uh, 2 million, then 8 million, and recently 70 million at a valuation of 1 billion. Um, so m my question goes to this. Um, the, the inv uh, so the investment that's been made, was that an equity investment or was it a soft? Or I mean, basically to kind of reframe this question. Is there a plan to introduce the token? So because basically, I, it, it it kind of I struggle to kind of make sense out of the software as a service business model that you're currently running with the with the, these valuations. Because I mean, sure, there's kind of companies for this for 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 whom that works, like the sales sales forces of the world. But obviously, your um, 
uh, your to your addressable market is so much smaller. So uh, how does this how does this all fit together? Yeah, sure. Um, so so let's start with like the business model, uh, which I which I didn't intend to to skip over uh, from the, from the previous question. So um, essentially. You know, what we do is uh, we allow anyone to use this tool for free. Um, we swallow all the infrastructure costs, all the work in, in terms of making this product um, super useful. Um, and then our philosophy is if you do it on in the open, anyone else can leverage what you do. You build sort of in public. And so that's free. What we essentially charge for is if you want to keep things private, you want to do it only for yourself. Uh, if you want to come use more resources, so have more performance on your queries, have more beefy infrastructure underneath it, have shorter wait times, these type of things. Um, and if you want to export data, which essentially means that you can do, you know, proprietary research, build your own business, um, whatever it might be, right? Um, so these are kind of the, the three main dimensions that we think make sense to, to monetize along. And I think, you know, to back up a bit, um, there are different ways to build a system um, and sort of say, you know, what, what do we kind of give away and what do we uh, maintain to, to make a business or whatever. Um, and I think we've kind of, our pr approach is like, we want, to, we want to solve problems. We want to be as useful as possible. And what we've figured out is like, if we do it in this way, we can have the most impact because so many people, so like, yeah, we, sure, we could open source everything and just like everything that we ever did is open source. But that actually would have way less impact, is our hypothesis, because so many people wouldn't be able to interface with these nodes to actually run this data infrastructure to operate and maintain this thing. Uh, you know, we have almost 50 engineers working full time on this. Uh, it, it's not a trivial problem. Um, and so, you know, that, that's the model we've taken where we think, you know, the community can get a lot from this uh, and, and we can monetize the people that have extra needs um, in different ways, but also sort of you know, have more of a business use case typically, uh, rather than, you know, just contributing. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the philosophy. We've raised uh, equity. Uh, if, you know, it's not that I want to completely rule out any other sort of Web3 play, uh, but I think for us, we're very concerned with taking long-term solutions and want to, you know, the, if we wanted to get rich as quickly as possible, like we would have done Dune in a different way. <laughs> but we care about building something that, you know, is long term, that is uh, sensible, even though prices are up 100% or down 90%, like I don't really care. Um, and so for, for now, we haven't found a model where we can swallow, you know, massive infrastructure bills and also kind of have a different structure. But over time, we definitely, you know, try to give economic opportunities to our creators as much as possible, wizards building on Dune. And so we'll always be mindful of, of the toolkit and what we can do. Uh, but I think it's also from our side, like ensuring that we don't get ourselves into a weird spot where we fall prey to some hype and then suddenly like, you know, six months later, you're in a really bad spot because you did something that actually doesn't make that much sense. Um, and also like just pragmatically solving problems every single day and ensuring that we're massively building something useful for for the community yeah, and you are so frederick i've i've used your dashboards and i've built my own dashboards and uh dune is such a fantastic tool and i don't i mean this in the least um adverse i know this sounds a little bit adversarial but basically so I'm a little bit struggling to understand where your moat comes from, right? So basically, even if you, I mean, you have 50 engineers and maybe we'll talk about what, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis in just a little bit, but say you're paying your engineers a really good salary, say 200K a year, that's 10 million a year for, for uh, 50 engineers, right? Um, and then uh, maybe add uh, the same amount again for your AWS bill, which is probably around the right number, I'm guessing. So it's 20 million a year for to 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 recreate something like um uh like Dune, but you still have this enormous valuation. So basically where's this expectation of profit from the VCs coming from? Yeah, no, great, great question. I, I'm not going to uh, comment particularly on on your estimates of, of how much it costs to, to run Dune, but but fair enough. Um I think you know, I think we're, at the end of the day, we're trying to build something useful. And I think we're abstracting away a lot of 
hard work for a lot of people. And I think if you run the protocol um, or a VC or, you know, other type of players, like we have big, you know, big brand names and whatnot playing in this space now, um, you know, you, you care about this data. Like it's important for your investing, for your um, running of uh, your business and, and whatnot. And I think, you know, the, the, the things I mentioned, like having more performance on working with this data, uh, having a private environment with, where your team can collaborate with this data, uh, exporting this data through API and, and these type of things, I think is like massively useful and people will pay for that convenience. And I think that's valuable. Uh, and the fact that people can come together. And as I mentioned, like, you know, we get a lot of people that contribute and we, the trade-off we've kind of made is like, we say, okay, we will swallow all these bills. We will make this system run. We will ensure that like, you know, everything is up and running and correct, <laughs> which is a massive effort. And then I think there's, a, you know, a lot of demand for build, getting more out of that tool. And I don't think that is, you know, necessarily, like we care deeply about the free experience of Dune. And so it's not like we, will suddenly just like rug all the free users and, you know, extract massive amounts of money from them. Uh, it's like we will make Dune more powerful over time and let people pay for extra features. And I think it's important sort of context there as well that like we did a play on like the long tail when we focused on the community in 2018. And yes, like I didn't have a salary for seven months because every single VC was like, there are five people you can sell this to. And we don't see this as a lucrative business. And we were like, actually, we think this five people is going to become like thousand and then thousand, then tens of thousands and, and whatnot, you know, over the, over the years. And and that's still the play we're doing. Yeah, yeah d don't, don't get me wrong. I think June is a fantastically useful tool, totally. Um, how, how do you feel about the comparison that's sometimes made with Bloomberg Terminal? I think that's... Um, understatement of what Dune is and can be. Um, so I think, as I alluded to earlier, like the fact that this data is open is like a total, total game changer. And Bloomberg is a fantastic product for a niche uh, in, in the finance world that, you know, care deeply about having a sort of proprietary understanding of what's whatever is happening in, in these financial markets. But, and so, you know, amazing product and, and fantastic what they've done and, and the, the position they have in that world. Um, I think the fact that you can have open-ended interaction with this data uh, as like together with the rest of the world is, is just enormous. Uh, and so I don't think of, like, I really don't think there's any product uh, out there that, that is comparable to, to what we're doing because it it has some of the aspects of like a GitHub where, you know, a lot of people come together and build on each other and, and, and you know, it's, it's a tool for uh, uh, for developers. Uh, and then you have the product of that, which GitHub doesn't have, but which kind of, you know, it's more of the Bloomberg thing with like, oh, there's actually a bunch of charts and a lot of people can just look at, which is incredibly useful. Uh, uh, but then you also have you know, the fact that this is public uh, and uh, which I think is um, a huge deal. And I think big kind of technology paradigms, uh, typically what you see succeed is like someone that, that really builds for some novel new aspect of a new platform or a new piece of technology. And to me, that is really what we're doing here. Um, we're not trying to recreate Bloomberg or recreate, you know, some tool that people had for their uh, product analytics, uh, and they would like pipe their whatever sort of usage data from their website into a tool like that. Like we're trying to build something that is uniquely enabled by and driving open data um, and understanding and utility of that data. And just the fact that if the, when there's a trade on on like a balancer pool, previously like there would be like one or two stakeholders to that data point would be like the PM and the you know, leader of that company that built that product. Like now there's like this explosion of stakeholders where it's like literally anyone can go on the internet and, and look into this data point and like make sense of it in whatever shape or form they want to. And I think it's 
still hard to grasp and appreciate like how big of a deal that is that like the world is the you know audience here and and of course not every single person in the world will go there but uh it's an opportunity and and i think that is you know the, the premise of what we're trying to do is like people can learn faster if they see what what other products are built and they can see the open source smart contracts but they can also see how what traction that smart contract got how do people use it how do people abuse it you know and i think what the blockchain is one of the exciting things about the blockchain is like anyone can build anyone can participate um, and you have this sort of bet on human creativity that like you just give people tools to do whatever they you know there will be a lot of stupid ideas but there will be some really good ones uh, and i think what we're enabling in that is that you can actually dissect what worked not just uh, with the thing you built yourself but with everything that anyone ever built and then you have this amazing sort of feedback loop and evolutionary force that's just so much faster and so much you know it's it's harsh also because if you build a product like it's out there like anyone can go and look at your metrics not just your manager which is of course intimidating but it's also like i think progressing this space way way faster than, than any other industry that you can think of yeah awesome that i i want to dive a little bit deeper into that so we we had mentioned a little bit right the maker DAO balance sheet we have also mentioned kind of other dashboards that have been built. I, I would be curious to hear from you, you know, what other use cases you found like really interesting or even like people building on top of Dune in a way that maybe maybe you didn't expect or also if if that hasn't happened yet, what what you would like to see build on Dune? Uh, I guess there there is kind of like two different things. One one is, uh, or two different worlds. One is when we, we launched the API, um, uh, which is it's going live by the end of the year for self-serve. We have kind of like a wait list, uh, private beta right now. Um, you know, that, that's going to be an explosion of uh, opportunity. But uh, inside of the Dune app, um, I think, frankly, <laughs> I do think um, that in many cases, the the crypto community should learn a little bit more from the, the sort of old world. I, I think a lot about, you know, what, what are features and what are bugs of, of the old world. And I think well, still too many crypto people think there's only bugs, uh, you know, in, in the old world and then everything needs to be reinvented. And I think maybe, you know, there surely are some bugs and I think we have an interesting new design space, but there might be some features after, you know, industries that have been around for a while. Um, and I so still think kind of, Startup 101 metrics are underrated. You know, what, what's you know, the traction of your product? What's the user base? Uh, what's the retention of that user base? Uh, you know, uh, what's the distribution of activity across different users? And you know, I, I, I still think what like a typical startup PM would want to look at is actually not that far from what people should look at in, in crypto as well. And like, you know, do the boring stuff, just like figure out, are we retaining users? Like, will this person come back or not? And if they don't come back, like why, right? Um, so I think that is still a bit under appreciated and, and people like to look at sort of TVL and uh, some high level like trading volume, which is probably a better metric than TVL at least. But, um, you know, I think that some of those kind of more sobering uh, metrics uh, is something that would be nice to, to look at. Uh, there was also like a very cool longer form research piece by a community member last week uh, on just like the uni, uni airdrop and, you know, what did that turn into? Um, and, you know, there, those are some pretty sobering uh, metrics in there where it's like, okay, I, I can't remember the exact metrics, but it's something like 90% sold, you know, more or less instantly. Um, it's like 7% of all the airdrop holders still hold the token um, and like a, a tiny fraction of that sort of increased their exposure and an even smaller, smaller um, portion participate in governance, right? Only, only like a tiny, tiny bit. Uh, and is the Uniswap volume driven by people that got the airdrop? No, <laughs> like that also fell from like 60% a year ago or something to like 5% now, right? So so it didn't retain users. Uh, most people just saw it as free money and 
dumped it and it didn't actually turn into like strong governance participation, right? And so I think that's those type of metrics and lessons, right, where, where people should say, what, what's the return on this initiative that I did? <laughs> like, what did we try to achieve and what did it turn into? It's like an exercise that more people in crypto should should do, I think, and, and be honest with themselves. And I think obviously like these times when, when, when prices are down and sentiment is down, like you kind of have to do these things um, and, and they matter, I guess, less when, when everything is up anyway. Um, so I feel like, you know, <laughs> in general, like letting, being a bit hard on yourself and thinking about the the stickiness of your product, the ROI of your activities. Um, and, and in that post, maybe we can link to it. You know, there are other airdrops as well that, uh, you know, you can look at the metrics and just see for yourself, like, you know, did they actually engage the community by doing this or, or did they not? And if they didn't, like, it's an incredibly expensive, you know, one-off marketing gig <laughs> that kind of, you know, I can, I can get a lot of people to use my product if I just go out and say, hey, here's like a thousand dollars on the street, right? Doesn't necessarily mean that I'm building a, a fantastic product or business. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, you know, good timing for for just like reading up on some startup one on one and and start to think about the ROI of of your initiatives. So user experience and um, a good hard look in the mirror. Um, I mean, clearly that's super advantageous for projects. Do you think there's um, something for the ecosystem uh, that the ecosystem can use to its advantage? Because obviously, I mean, volatility in crypto is large, despite the fact that in principle, a lot of the data is public. So, I mean, obviously, there's some data that's not looked at or that 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 kind of is subject to externalities. Do you think um, we can kind of leverage Dune um, to that end as well? I guess uh, you can definitely you know l learn a lot from from history, right? And and I think it's probably a good. You know, now we've had a lot of lessons, there, and, and the pace has been in incredibly high. Uh, you've had prices going up and prices crashing down, and you have all all these systems that's been built and all these things that happened, airdrops and and va vampire attacks and whatnot. So I think it's probably a good time to be a. Uh, you know, stu student of, of the on-chain activity, right? And and, and maybe uh, you don't even have to be an engineer to do that, right? But if you're looking for uh, products to build, uh, I think it's like an amazing time for, for learning some lessons. And there's been a lot of stress tests. And um, I think now, instead of just the end, you know, DeFi or NFT project being thrown together in the week and then racing, $10 million uh, in, in two weeks, uh, you know, people can actually sit down and say, okay, you know, did any of this actually work? Are there interesting pieces here? So um, I don't know exactly what to look at or not, frankly, you know, but, but I'd be mindful of, especially this, like, you know, what, I think one thing that's underrated a bit in crypto is like, if someone is getting paid for something, someone is picking up the bill in one way or another, like there are no free lunches, like, if you have some kind of like token emission scheme related to using your product, like the other token holders are taking dilution. Um, there's no way ever that money just like appears out of thin air. Um, and so uh, I think that is at least something to be very mindful of uh, that, you know, the way you design these things, someone's going to pay a price if other people are receiving money. So, uh, you know, <laughs> think about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you have been extraordinarily successful in kind of building this community of Dune wizards, as you call them. I would actually struggle to to name one infrastructure project that kind of has a better community than you guys. Um, how did you do that? Uh, do it, and uh, wh what are your learnings? Well, well, thank you for that. Like, so, so for the first two years, Dune was just mods and me. Like the only, we hired no one and as I mentioned, you know, have had no salary and then very little salary and we didn't hire anyone after our first fundraise or anything like that. So we were very lean, but I think we had a very, very deep passion for 
helping people on Dune uh, and making them succeed. Like our telegrams and Twitter DMs and like we, there, were, there weren't that many, like there were pretty few users, but we were extremely committed to making them succeed. And we did very hands-on support for helping people succeed. And this includes several people that didn't know SQL, but we like help them learn SQL so that they could use you, right? And and for instance, Tio from then researcher at the block and then now at Uniswap, he he was like, hey, this seems like a cool product. Can I get it in Excel? And I was like, no, but I can learn you how to do SQL. And we had like a bi-weekly call where I would like, you know, give him lessons in how to, to use Dune. Uh, so, so that was the level of commitment. And I think that has been, you know, kind of snowballed in, into what is the Dune com- community because, you know, our first community manager, uh, for, uh, Broxer, uh, he had that similar you know, uh, passion. And I think every single person that has come into the Dune community and felt this support and people saying, yeah, let's get on a call, you know, let DM into to the late hours on like trying to make this query run. Uh, I think that has really, you know, compounded to to a culture where, where people say, oh yeah, you know, l- let me help you out. And, and I think one of the things I'm most proud of with everything we built is, is really the Dune community and just like going to the Discord, Dune Discord, like several thousand people, but it's still like mostly just people asking about queries and getting answered to those queries. Um, it's not a ton of crap. And, you know, I think it's, it's still very much active, even though prices are down 80, 90 percent. Um, and I think that comes from, you know, a, a passion for, for really helping people and um, being as, you know, uh, there was this funny thing where like Mott's, my co-founder, he recently realized he had like all his Telegram notifications turned off, uh, but he had like an exception for one of our early users. So that would like get straight to the home screen of his phone. Like if they DM'd him on, on Telegram, like it would pop up on his phone on a Friday night and he would like get in there and you know make that query run. So so I think that you know passion that we put into it is, is something that has actually scaled uh, into, into a wider community. Yeah, super interesting. So So you're saying, you didn't have to give thousand dollars to every Dune wizard to <laughs> to use the product. <laughs> no, exactly not. Right. Awesome. Yeah, I think maybe I guess are you working on like specific things? We know there was also the Dune Con. Maybe you can also talk a little bit about the like, first conference. But I think from what I hear, it's a lot. Yeah, in, on the field, like helping in Discord. But do you also have certain I don't know learning material like documentation? Is that something you're working on, or or how do you improve that even even further? Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, we're working on a lot of educational efforts. Uh, we have a big community team now. Um, we're doing meetups and yeah, we did DuneCon, which was a massive success in, in Berlin uh, a couple of months ago. Um, so so we really tried to get people engaged and, and help them out, uh, both sort of hands-on, but, but definitely also sort of more self-serve with the educational series and whatnot. Um, so we are working on several sort of bigger initiatives. Um, it is one, one thing that's, you know, honestly a challenge is like we were doing this like system migrations and like we have the V1 and then we have the V2 and like there's a different dialect of SQL and like, you know, these are kind of some of the, the messy things of, of building a company where it's like, oh yeah, we want to have all the best you know, educational resources, obviously, but then, you know, oh, there, there are different versions and which one, you know, can we support and, and what features do we have today? Then what do we have tomorrow and, and, and whatnot? But um, yeah, we're, we're certainly keep investing in, in education and, and letting people become powerful wizards um, and sort of leveling up and giving them bounty opportunities. And we have a job board and all these type of things. And we have seen several people sort of pivot their careers in, into just doing this, which is fantastic. Um, and then yeah, there are some, you know, I we touched upon it, but the Dune API, I think, is huge, uh, huge game changer. Like, the, the what you can do with data in this space is going to be forever changed uh, when you can just click a button and turn any query result on Dune into an endpoint uh, that you can leverage for building or trading or researching or, you know, whatever you see fit. Uh, so uh, I'm pretty pumped for that. So SQL is um, 
pretty straightforward um, in terms of, you know, programming languages or databases. So if you know two things about databases, you can carry it. But still, there's a lot of people who are kind of afraid of um, code, right? And in principle, it should be relatively easy or comparatively easy when compared with other uh, programming instances to kind of open this to natural language processing, kind of like what from Alpha has done for Mathematica, right? H have you looked into that? Because it would immediately um, balloon your target audience, you know, from a couple of thousand people to literally millions. Yeah, great, great question. Um, I think the, the big challenge there is kind of going from I think it's like relatively easy to build a cool prototype that you know takes some of the like most obvious things and and turns it into like a result and, and like creates a SQL query for you under underneath the hood. Um, so I think you know that is very cool. I guess what I'm wondering is you know to what extent does that extend to like all kinds of weird messy things that that humans you know would actually put into like a search box and. Uh, how could you, use, to what extent can you serve that into a compelling product experience? And how many people will actually go and do that versus just like look at something that's kind of pre-curated? Um, so I think for us, like, we're very mindful of just trying to do like, you know, the most obvious thing first. And, and we feel like still there's a lot of work to just like make the querying experience on Dune better, have cleaner tables, have it run faster, um, you know, some of these uh, type of things that just gonna make writing SQL on Dune even easier, even faster and, and more powerful. Uh, and then over time, like we're, we're excited about other ways of interacting with this data, if that's Python and notebooks or um, you know uh, some natural language uh, sort of experience. But um, I think it's, it's, it's still, you know, we, we still think that we have some more basic things to, to get to. Uh, and, and I'm also, I think, yeah, one need to be very conscious of will people actually use this product and, and like how good will it be? And especially if you're thinking more of like a consumer audience, it, it needs to be very polished. And I don't think you can have that many rough edges before people sort of just get annoyed and don't use it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah fair enough. Um in a way, basically, if you look at UN trends, I actually do this regularly, at least every other day or so, uh, just because it's super interesting to kind of see what other people find interesting in query, right? So um, in a way, you kind of get a front row seat to developments in the ecosystem. Um, so w what's your take on where we're at and uh, w what should we collectively pay more attention to? Yeah, no, I, I definitely have a hope that, that people can you know, be, be a bit less on Twitter and be a bit more on, on trending dashboards on Dune and we can get even better at surfacing like what you should actually look at and, and that a uh, hack can just as well be, uh, you know, discovered by, by looking at trending dashboards on Dune as, as on Twitter per se. Um, but yeah, I think uh, a good thing to think about now is, is kind of risks. <laughs> you know, there's uh, all of these fallouts. Obviously, a lot of this was actually not on-chain products, but sort of things uh, just like in, in the industry that that was uh, off-chain. Um, but I think uh, understanding, you know, the, the risks, uh, I think is, is a good uh, idea. And, and I guess people are now second-guessing sort of everything and, and all their exposure in all kinds of different products and what mechanisms kind of actually make sense. So I feel like, you know, again, this is one of the powerful things of Dune. It's like, instead of sticking your money into you know, a black box and, and hoping that someone is taking care of it, like you can actually do your own research in terms of what that box is and, and what's in it and, you know, what the exposure might be or not. So um, I feel like, you know, some of these uh, sort of Dissecting, like as I mentioned, MakerDAO have actually done like a really good job at exposing their balance sheet. But but that type of exercise for for more products, I think, makes sense. What's you know in there? If you're getting some interest rate, you know what 
what, what, what's the reason for that? You can actually see what kind of exposure sits on the other end. Right. I guess one thing that we also shortly mentioned at the start was basically FTX and, and um, that fallout, as you mentioned. So I guess one question is, obviously, Dune focused on on-chain data. Um, do you think Dune can also help these kind of centralized parties or, or do we need to like move everything on chain what's your what's your take on on that yeah i think we can we can definitely help um we have a relatively new like labels data set that anyone can uh, contribute to and uh, i'd say you know we have some work to do to maybe streamline this and make it easier for the exchanges to to actually show um you know what their addresses are uh, but my sense is that you know the, the actually legitimate ex exchanges now seem, you know, they, they care a lot about the confidence that people have in, in their uh, business. So they are quite uh, keen to to show you know what uh, their exposures are and uh, what their on chain activity looks like. Um, and definitely, I think you know we have helped surface some of that, and and the Dune community, you know. Um, one thing I find amazing is like whenever something happens, there is instantly dashboards, you know, right away that, that track uh, what's happening on chain related to whatever event, including FTX and Alameda. Uh, but um, I think we, we have a job to do to you know, make it easier to sort of have the exchanges actually, you know, verify this or say, you know, these are our addresses and, and easier instead of just like sort of submitting a blog, blog post or whatever with like a list, you know, actually make it into an experience where a user can say, oh, you know, this is what they said their addresses are and here's the related activity on chain, right? Yeah, but it can only ever be like a part of the puzzle, right? Because there's no way of really tracking liabilities on chain. Depend I mean, obviously some liabilities you could, but, you know. No, no, that's true. That's true, of course. Like, you know, uh, and, I, and I think there will, there will always be... <laughs> off-chain lending and, and leverage and, and agreements and, and whatnot. So uh, we can, of course, only track what's on-chain. But of course, the on-chain products, uh, there you can actually see the exposure. So I guess the solution is both more info from from the off-chain uh, businesses, but also hopefully a bit more on-chain uh, usage as well. Yeah. <laughs> so Frederick, what's, what's next for Dune? Uh, you have 50 people working on stuff. So what can we expect? Yes, uh, you can expect uh, the Dune API, which uh, is, is a very powerful um, thing, I think. Um, and you can expect we are launching more team functionality so people can more easily uh, collaborate, uh, both in the private and public setting. So you can get you know in, into it with your team. We're working on more ways for people to create data sets and contribute um, you know, make it easier to cast spells, as, as we say, in the Spellbook product, create more of their own data tables. Um, we're working on some very, very exciting sort of ways to make this, interacting with this data more performant. Um, and sort of we are investing very deeply in the querying, querying experience on Dune, um, helping both in sort of the interface layer, but also in the, the data and query engine layer to, to make it the most performance experience out there. Uh, that's one of the benefits of the scale we have is that we, you know, you asked earlier, like, what, what do the people do? And, and part of the answer is like, we're really, so, something that's not announced yet even, but like, we're going very deep into the stack and, and customizing it for the world of blockchains. And I think it's a unique thing that we have this predefined data set that's like somewhat structured and we want to build something that's like uniquely you know, tailored for that experience uh, versus most other data products are built for you know, some arbitrary data set being plugged into it um, uh, because the nature of data sets has been very heterogeneous. Um, so uh, in, in general, you know, we're just trying to make it easier to do more experiments, do more building and learning. Um, and uh, in, in various different ways. So yeah, that's what we're up to. Super exciting. So where do where do people go to kind of learn more about Dune or get help building their first queries? Is is the Discord where everything where everyone is at? 
yeah, uh, there is Dune.com where you can see all the dashboards, see what's trending, all, all that good stuff. Uh, we have a community tab uh, on top, uh, right next to the new query button, where you can um, you know, see all the learning material, uh, find the Discord, and then connect with the community. Uh, we're at Dune Analytics on Twitter, uh, where you can see a lot of what's, what's being built. Uh, we have a weekly newsletter with a lot of great breakdowns and analysis based on data, for instance, the new... Uniswap research post on, on like what happened with the uni token airdrop and, and what that turned into on chain. So uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty accessible. It's uh, if you're curious and, and uh, interested in data, um, I think we're pretty easy to find and uh, hopefully we'll make your life easy and exciting. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Frederick, for coming on. I think this is a great place to wrap up. So yeah, we're excited to try out the API and uh, yeah, hope to have you on at some point again in the future. Thank you so much for having me and congrats on, I don't know, 478 episode or something. Is that uh, where, what we're at? Uh, that's a uh, very impressive consistency. I think it's uh, 472. It's 72. like almost 10 right. years now. We've missed one week. This is still a sore spot for us, uh, but yeah, we missed I, I one week. It. That's uh, <laughs> so impressive. It's uh, not to be underestimated how hard it is to do something for a long time. So uh, well <laughs> done. Congrats to you guys. Thank you, Frederick.